Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another webinar here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. I am Donna Prosser. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer here. And today we are talking about a hot topic right now, um, and that is the topic of burnout. And how can we reduce burnout in healthcare? What are some strategies that clinicians and leaders can employ to, to uh, deal with this very significant problem that we have? Um, we, our objectives today are uh, very straightforward. We're going to talk about some of the root causes of burnout in healthcare and how to recognize those signs in yourself and in your colleagues. Uh, but most importantly, talking about ways that we can mitigate that burnout at both an individual and an organizational level. As always, we're going to provide continuing education credit for nurses, pharmacists, and physicians through our our, our partner MedStar Health, uh, respiratory therapists may also be eligible for this depending on your state. So if you are interested in collecting this CE, you will receive a, an email from MedStar directing you what you need to do within the next five to seven days to, to obtain that CE. Uh, we will also, for this webinar, be providing continuing education credit for healthcare executives. Um, if you want that, then please just log this event into your ACHE account. Certified professional, um, professionals in patient safety will receive a certificate from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, as well as board certified patient advocates. Um, and then for uh, certified professionals in healthcare quality, your attendance will be documented by NAHQ. We will let them know that um, you attended today. As you can see here on this slide, none of the planners or the participants in this webinar have any disclosures to report. Now we want this to be interactive. So, um, so get your phones out or open a new browser on your computer. You can go to slido.com and type in the number 383753, or you can use your cell phone um, and just take a, a picture of the QR code that you see on the screen right now. And that'll get you into the program, our polling software, because we're going to be asking you some, um, some questions during this session. Uh, we, as always, we, you know, in, in, in keeping this interactive, we want your comments on chat, your questions in the Q&A. We will have 15 minutes of question and answer at the end. Just one more reminder to please log on to Slido uh, right now, because in just a few minutes, we're going to ask our very first polling question. So now it is, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Vonda Vaden Bates. Vonda is, uh, is a medical safety advocate, but she's also the CEO of 10th Dot. So she has a lot of wonderful organizational experience. She's also a member of the board of directors here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and participates in, um, in so many wonderful things with us. And um, we are always love to have Vonda moderate our session. So welcome, Vonda. I'll have you now introduce the rest of our panelists. Thank you, Donna, and thank you to the committee members who have helped us come here today. And please forgive me, everyone. <clears throat> I am developing a little bit of a cold. It is not COVID tested, um, but you might find me just a little bit raspy today. I just will begin by saying that uh, in 2012, my husband died from a preventable medical error. And that is how I come to even understanding the issues that are presented within the medical systems today. And that burnout is particularly one of those issues that has um, been drawn near and dear to my heart because it relates very much to the work in my career, but also because having spent 12 days in the hospital with my husband before he died, it was very evident to me where there was a resourced clinician, physician, nurse, or staff member within that hospital system, and where there was an unresourced, when, the, when there seemed to be an exhausted person attempting to move past their boundaries. It is in our human nature to push past our boundaries, and there are plenty of upsides. We go to the moon because we we push past the limits of our thinking and our, and our um, perceived capacities. But when systems begin to press against our limits, 
um, repetitively, that impacts safety in our medical system. And it impacts it for those who are delivering care, those who are receiving care, and those who are supporting care. The panelists who are joining us today are professionals within healthcare who have particularly paid attention to and are drawing our um, intervention strategies toward that which will help improve burnout in the medical systems. I'll start by introducing Kim Baker, who has a Master's of Science in Nursing and is a Behavioral Health Programmatic Nurse Specialist at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Presbyterian Hospital. Kim, thank you for joining us today. Oscar San Roman Orozco is an MD in the Institution of Applied Global Public Health initiative at Universidad Autónoma de Quintero in Mexico. And Colonel Lewis Stout is also has his Master's of Science in Nursing and is a retired Colonel from the US Army Nurse Corps, is a chief as a Chief Nursing Officer at Madigan Army Medical Center. I want to thank the three panelists for being here today and bringing to this audience both those who are here present uh, live in this conversation, as well as those who will be uh, watching us and watching this webinar later. Your expertise matters a lot um, for this audience, but also in the institutions that you serve and have served. Oscar, I will begin by focusing on something that you created. Um, we're going to present, uh, actually, first of all, let me ask a quick polling question. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead just a little bit. Donna, would you pull up that polling question? And we'll ask the audience here to weigh in on what effective measures or interventions or strategies have you witnessed with regard to burnout? This is an open-ended, open-ended question that we would invite you to respond to. And that polling question will stay open. So if nothing's coming to you immediately, or you're still wanting to get up to speed on the slido.com and putting that number 383753 in, um, then just know that it will remain open for you to um, until we ask the next polling question, which will be quite some time from now. And I see some responses already. Um, time off, recognition of valiant efforts, time away from work, self-care, resigning from uh, affecting job positions. I know we are seeing a lot of that today. That is an act of uh, a response to what I would think of as unreasonable circumstances or expectations of our human capacity. So keep, keep putting those responses in there. I will continue to look at them and Donna will pass along anything in the chat that she thinks might be important for um, myself and the panelists to note. And next, I will move over to you, Oscar, and ask you if you wouldn't mind, Donna's going to share a systems map that you created. And I do want to preface this by saying that this is not a complete map. One of the great things that I admire so much about the Patient Safety Movement Foundation is that they are particularly skilled at, at starting and managing and perpetuating collaborations that bring a number of perspectives together on particular problems. And Oscar, I know you've used this tool to look at other problems in healthcare systems issues. And I would just like for you to very quickly show us what you've created here. And then I have a question with regard to how that relates to burnout. Thank you, Wanda, and thank you, everyone. It's it's a pleasure. Uh, first of all, good morning uh, to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. And yeah, well, basically, systems thinking has been uh, well in the past recent years. Uh, some uh, thing that that it's starting to evolve and helping us to look things differently. Uh, like a lot, there's a lot of literature there, uh, but basically, the the idea is to point that in every system that is alive, that is, uh, it, it's continuously changing and many factors are affecting each uh, one to another. A plus B is not equal C, is, this is what it 
can mean. So um, this is the, uh, the idea of this system. What, what I try to point out here, it was that we have two main factors in, in the middle. In the middle, we have burnout uh, in healthcare. That is like a bubble in which all the different factors, if you put more air in one bubble, is going to impact the, the other bubble and so on and so on. That's why they have different color codes and stuff. But the idea is that you have personal factors and environmental factors, so social, societal factors around it. And that's basically a point of um, showing this. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. And I am uh, wondering if you might want to draw our attention to maybe one or two that you see in this very early map. Uh, again, this is this is a tool that could be used, and I would even recommend that maybe the Patient Safety Movement Foundation work with you and some of the individuals who are attending here today to really um, pull this map apart. But are there one or two here that you think might be levers that would cross over many different populations across um, across this global across this global issue? Yeah, for sure. The, the idea, three, three very important things that we can highlight here. Like the first, the, the one that you mentioned, it's this leverage point in which you will see that a lot of arrows connect or uh, when you start building it and you start drawing it, um, like, like you mentioned it, that's very important to mention. This is obviously my perspective and, and the colleague's perspective that helped me here to, to say, oh, you should put this, you should put this. But the idea of these systems map and system thinking is the more you know of a system, the more you know the system, the, the better the understanding will be. So in here, this is we have a mental health, if you can see like in the middle of the human figure, there, there's a lot of arrows there. Mental health, if, if we start influencing mental health, we can start obviously influence and reduce uh, burnout in healthcare. And how um, that's that could be one of the leverage points in which uh, we already know that. But the idea also here is to find a, another kind of things that are, for example, the feedback loops or the unintended consequences. Sometimes when you start acting in some place, you will impact the other one and, and so on and so on. And same with the feedback loops. When you start acting in, you start drawing, uh, working in interventions uh, on mental health, you obviously reduce uh, burnout in healthcare, but you can also uh, influence the family situation. You can also influence the mindfulness, which is also related with the mental health of the person. So that from the personal perspective and, and from the environmental perspective, you can see, for example, the, the leadership style of the, of the leaders in the, um, in the field of, of what the bosses, how are they uh, giving the workload to, to, their, uh, to their staff, the bureaucratic task, uh, what's the political situation influencing them and the educational system and the healthcare system. So the idea here, and, and this is how I like to uh, wrap up a little bit this, uh, with these three very brief uh, uh, strategy, way to look at a different strategy is to start to, to open and look at all the different small factors that we think they don't act or they don't influence, but if you start adding them up, they will start impacting something. So mm -hmm. here, here you have, a, like I mentioned, mental health, and it, it will. If you start seeing all the different things around mental health, it's, it's a whole world. If you start right. looking at there, it's same thing. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. And I am uh, wondering if you might want to draw our attention to maybe one or two that you see in this very early map. Uh, again, this is this is a tool that could be used, and I would even recommend that maybe the Patient Safety Movement Foundation work with you and some of the individuals who are attending here today to really um, pull this map apart. But are there one or two here that you think might be levers that would cross over many different populations across um, across this global across this global issue? Yeah, uh, for sure. The, the idea, three, three very important things that we can highlight here. Like the first, the, the one that you mentioned, it's this leverage point in which you will see that a lot of arrows connect or uh, when you start building it and you start drawing it, um, like, like you mentioned it, that's very important to mention. This is 
obviously my perspective or and, and a colleague's perspective that helped me here to to say oh you should put this you should put this but the idea of these systems map and systems thinking is the more you know of a system the more you know the system the, the better the understanding will be so in here this is we have a mental health if you can see like in the middle of the human figure there there's a lot of arrows there Mental health, if, if we start influencing mental health, we can start obviously influence and reduce uh, burnout in healthcare. And how um, that's that could be one of the leverage points in which uh, we already know that. But the idea also here is to find a, another kind of things that are, for example, the feedback loops or the unintended consequences. Sometimes when you start acting in some place, you will impact the other one and, and so on and so on. And same with the feedback loops. When you start acting and you start drawing, uh, working in interventions uh, on mental health, you obviously reduce uh, burnout in healthcare, but you can also uh, influence the family situation. You can also influence the mindfulness, which is also related with the mental health of the person. So that's from the personal perspective. And, and from the environmental perspective, you can see, for example, the, the leadership style of the of the leaders in the um, in the field of, of what the bosses how are they uh, giving the workload to to their uh, to their staff the bureaucratic task uh, what's the political situation influencing them and the educational system and the healthcare system so the idea here and and this is how I like to uh, wrap up a little bit this uh, with these three very brief uh, uh, strategy way to look at a different strategy is to start to, to open and look at all the different small factors that we think they don't act or they don't influence. But if you start adding them up, they will start impacting something. So mm -hmm. here, here you have, a, like I mentioned, mental health. And it, it will if you start seeing all the different things around mental health, it's, it's a whole world. If you start right. looking at there, it's the same thing. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Kim, um, uh, Colonel Stout, what do you see as some of the organizational drivers of burnout? Um, Oscar points to some of those on the systems map. What are you seeing in, you, in your organizations and in your experience? I think that first, the recognition that healthcare has really become a business um, and recognizing that shift from the patient to the customer and the focus of that and the association with the not only the staff at the bedside and the treating providers, but also from an institution or organizational level. That societal shift of customer has really, um, I think, driven much of the burnout that we see, especially at the bedside. I am an inpatient, I work in the inpatient setting, and we certainly see that societal shift impacting. And the organization has to support it. I mean, we recognize that. You know, it is healthcare has become a business and we have to treat it as such. And sometimes that takes the patient focus away and puts it more toward that customer element. Yeah, I can see that. Colonel Stone? I think uh, one of the issues that I see with a, an organization is the uh, redundancy of workload that's uh, pushed out to the, the clinicians uh, often tasks are added, but uh, it's rare that tasks are taken away. So uh, organizations have certain requirements or they're interpreted as certain requirements uh, and those are, are passed to the, to the clinician uh, for uh, each healthcare visit. Um, you know, as we say, requirements to check certain boxes uh, and it just, it's compounded uh, and it's just adding to the complexity uh, and it's actually taking time away from uh, our clinical visit. So uh, that's uh, always a distractor. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Kim, I'm really interested in that focus on business, you know, the business model that has now, um, you know, we, we almost feel like it's a must, like that is a requirement. Um, and given that, then what are some of the barriers for administrators to address burnout? Well, I think Lewis just said it best, really that workload, right? And recognizing that we cannot give as administrators, as leaders, 100% all the time to every single topic that we have to address. And 
recognizing the own, our own institutional barriers, that redundancy, the e-record we find um, from an administrative perspective, which I know also, you know, accompanies the clinical perspective, the barriers that we see just with the e-record bill. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to workload of administration, I think what we see is not only can we not give 100%, but then our, um, those that are surrounded by us, our patients see we're not giving 100%. They see our attempts to multitask. And those attempts to multitask usually result in one uh, one task not being fulfilled completely. The, we have regulatory requirements, requirements to the customer aspect, our HCAP scores, work-life balance, all those things are, are in our minds from an administrative perspective. But we ask our employees to check their feelings at the time clock, and we just know that simply it's possible. So. Yeah, you know, you make an interesting point there that I think is important for us to keep in mind when we're looking at this issue, and that is that burnout is it doesn't uh, stop based on role, whether you are a nurse or a physician or a, a person who is managing the health and well-being and the cleanliness of a system um, or an administrator. Uh, no one is immune from burnout, and the system itself is uh, is something that can contribute to that at an individual human level. Colonel Stad, I'll ask you the same question, but I'll focus on a different part of the equation. When you look at physician burnout, what are some of the barriers for physicians in addressing burnout specifically? One of the things that I see is, uh, you know, as I mentioned, just the um, addition of administrative tasks. Uh, you know, we have uh, professionals' uh, expertise in every single area. You know, they've spent years uh, honing their craft, becoming experts at what they do. Uh, and then um, oftentimes there's bureaucratic um, requirements that are just uh, laid on them uh, without the organization taking the time to really do a review and say, what is this really the responsibility of a clinician? Uh, is this something that the clinician should be spending their time doing as opposed to administrative personnel? So do we have the right mix of personnel in, in each work area? Uh, and that takes time you know, for the organization, but it's important uh, and it needs to be balanced. So. Um, the administrative point of view with the clinician point of view, uh, you know, oftentimes policies written uh, are not uh, policies received, so they don't have the same consequence of, of the intention. Um, and so you need to balance that, you know, we can put all policies in place, but if they're not realistic, uh, then they're not helpful to the organization uh, and they're confusing. Uh, and that just leads to, again, distraction. Uh, and just increases uh, the stress uh, and the burnout. Yeah. Uh, one of our audience members points to something that relates to that in, it, in not putting the policies in place and not doing some of the things that we know could help change the culture, create systems that are actually um, supportive of individuals thriving in their roles. What will happen instead is there is a mindset and a language set that focuses on more of the blame and shame. Sarah, thank you for that comment because I think it is really difficult. And I will say that as I was preparing to moderate this panel today, I noticed that my own mindset of um, what I would call of, you know, wanting to like pull myself up by the bootstraps, some of those, some of those internal messages that I have had since the time I can remember being a human, that is about you know, pushing myself past my, um, my perceived breaking point going further than I think um, I can. And while there is a time and a place for that, when there is a repeated expectation around that, and then on top of that, a language and a framing that there's something wrong with the human because they're not able to, um, I, I read a number of, of evidence-based research and um, you know documents that are really framed through the lens of, of 
a language that's around us humans not being enough to be able to do the job and not for example, like if I wanted to fly or take a train or drive my car from here to California, if my vehicle runs out of gas, I do not blame the car. I do not blame the gas tank. Um, and so I do hope that one of the things that um, that this webinar will do and that the work that those who are here present today can do is to help change the model of our thinking around this. Uh, with that in mind, I want to ask a question about these ingrained systems that are that are complex. There are economic drivers, insurance, there's an opaque uh, payment structures, pressures to increase productivity while reducing costs. It, it all appears to me sometimes as being unfixable, untenable. And I'm, I, I am aware that inroads are being made by organizations such as the ones that the panelists here today serve. I would like to hear from each of you, if we could, about what you're seeing that are actually driving changes to better align performance expectations with true human capacity. Um, Kim, would you like to start? Sure, I have to, um, just going back to what you said previously, I think it is also important to recognize that as leaders, often we will praise an individual for pushing themselves too far. You did a great job working that fourth 12 hour shift this week or you know, commending them for staying over three hours to chart. Instead of saying, what can we do to ensure that you're getting out of here on time and not having to work an additional shift? So I definitely think that is, from when we talk to the administrative and the organizational you know, contribute, uh, contributions, that's one of those things. But mm -hmm to those um, complexities and what we can do to drive um, some realistic expectations, is to set realistic expectations. I think we don't do that anymore as, 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 as healthcare. I think that the expectation, and again, going back to that societal shift, the expectation is that as, patient, as a patient, that every individual need will be met exactly when you expect it to be met. Um, and I think that providers also have that same expectation that their expectation is to do that, to meet that every need in that moment. And just immediately from the beginning, setting a realistic expectation to the, to the patient, to the caregiver, we know you can't do all of these things at the exact same time. We use um, the aid it, you know, really just setting a duration. I think that that's very important. I, letting patients know, I will get you within this time frame. However, um, or letting staff know, I'll get you within this time frame. We will meet this often, but really sticking to those durations, but not setting an unrealistic duration when you're doing so. Um, and then making sure you're really explaining to not only your maybe your subordinate or your patient or the patient explaining to the nurse, just not only explaining, you know, this is what I expect, but also this is how, um, how I expect it to be completed. And I don't mm. do the best job of that in healthcare. Thank you, Kim. Oscar, what's your perspective on that? What are medical professionals and, and what can people do to help drive change that really better aligns performance expectations with human capacity? Usually what I what I would say is to to go back to where 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 the system is was like was born or where are the bases and where are we sitting at because if we want to to change uh, that part or that uh, like last part of the tree if we could say see it like a tree in, in a metaphor let's look at the roots of the of of those problems usually here in Mexico happens a lot that um, a root of the problem is uh, the since the education system, uh, because how uh, residents are in charge of what the um, medical, the, what the doctors in, in base or on duty have to make. So you're giving some students uh, more tasks than they, uh, they actually need to be shared. And that's because of a, hier a hierarchy system that needs to be changed. So, for example, here, uh, what I also uh, we need to look at is um, go back, look at the root and start changing the root from the problem, because if we start just like a tree cutting just the branches and, and starting to fix the tree will still keep uh, growing, but we need to go to the to the basic uh, of the problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate that perspective. Colonel Stout. 
think uh, where I found the organization to be most effective uh, in making change is uh, having a collaborative discussion. Um, as you know, we've alluded to several times you know, between executives, uh, administrators, uh, and uh, clinicians, uh, there can be a disconnect in uh, what the workload truly is. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we've said it, we're just adding, you know, well, I'm just adding one thing, um, but it's being added to uh, already a very long list of, of tasks uh, that have been uh, interpreted from different organizations or, uh, you know, certifying bodies or the organization itself as being uh, requirements uh, without actually understanding or measuring the amount of time that's required to meet those tasks. Uh, and, you know, whether it's uh, the electronic health record uh, is what should be looked at is, you know, the number of keystrokes required, you know, how long does it take to get in and out uh, of each patient record uh, that takes an amount of time and, and the patients see that it was already said, uh, the patients see the distraction, they see the amount of time required, uh, they see the clinicians uh, hurrying uh, to get through uh, the, the task of having to see the patient so that they can do their, their documentation or doing their documentation while they're seeing the patient. Uh, and you know, not, not truly focused, uh, having the ability to truly focus on the patient, which is leading to burnout. Uh, you know, our clinicians want to uh, spend their time you know, with, with the patient. That's what they're there for. That's what they've trained for. Uh, and that's truly the satisfaction of uh, the profession. Uh, and we get mired down in a lot of the administrative tasks. So when we can sit down and really walk through that and then uh, identify redundancy, identify uh, those areas that uh, are you know, being documented in multiple places or getting done by uh, multiple people in different areas, uh, you know, we, when we can eliminate certain parts, uh, not only do we become more efficient, but we're more likely to have um, proper documentation uh, because uh, you, often you miss it in one place, but you know, cause it's done in, in three other places. Uh, and then somebody measures it and say, it's not being done. Well, it is being done. It's just not being documented somewhere else. Mm -hmm. As I listen to you, Colonel Stout, I think about, you know, uh, that let's let systems do what systems do best and let people do what people do best. And right now it feels like there's this convoluted um, attempt to cross those boundaries and not really honor the both the the assets and benefits that come from uh, from those the, from individuals as well as from systems, but also not really honoring the limitations of those as well, um, and setting our systems up to do so well. Um, I want to acknowledge a couple of really important comments that are made in the chat here. Um, thank you, Maureen, Melody, and Terry, uh, Susan. Um, also, Alyssa. Um, Donna, could you put up again that map, the systems map that Oscar presented, there's a request to see that again, and I think it, it would be interesting to see that or to let the audience see it again. Before, um, before we continue on, there's, there's something that is really nagging at me, and that is, and it, it is not something that the current panelists have expertise in, so I just want to acknowledge that, but it is one of the things that the Patient Safety Movement Foundation is really looking at the education system and looking at governance systems to help support and mitigate some of the stressors that are are being seen within the systems of healthcare throughout. And so I don't, although we're not focusing on that today in this webinar, if you take a look at some of the broader uh, webinars that the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, as well as other organizations have been presenting over the last couple of years, you will find that there are a number of intervention strategies that are being promoted and uh, carefully looked upon to help address uh, both burnout, but also some of the repercussions from burnout, like attrition, et cetera. Thank you for showing that, Donna. Let's go to a question. Um, we have another polling question for the audience, and that is, where is your organization focusing efforts to mitigate burnout? And again, this is an open-ended question, and uh, I would invite you to take a look at the screen 
And let's just look at what some of the organizations that are represented here today by this audience are doing to help mitigate burnout. Increasing their communications with employees. Yes, COVID has resulted in efforts to fall flat. We're just treading water. I, I, I hear that, I see that. Um, I also think it's important for us to note that burnout is not stopping at the doors of our healthcare systems. I support a number of patients who are working um, or you know, uh, in relationship with long-term healthcare issues and in some case, uh, terminal situations. And the burnout is very real there as well. So this is not something that is limited to those who are delivering care, administrating care, supporting care. It is also being felt, witnessed, and is having a strong influence on those who are receiving care. Donna, would you just, is it possible for you to scroll a little bit on that? Organizations trying to give time off, which is of course complicated by the short staff ratios. One of the statistics I saw recently um, in New York, and I think this is several months old actually, that um, over 2,000 nurses, uh, there was fewer, 2,000 fewer nurses in one particular healthcare system in uh, upper state New York over the period of, you know, since COVID had started. And I think that was about a year old. Thank you, Donna. And thank you for your continued comments. This poll will stay open if you want to continue to respond to that. Thank you very much for doing so. Let's come back to the panelists. I want to break this down a little bit. In terms of prevention, the day-to-day -day interventions, and long-term solutions, I'll call on you, Oscar, to first start us out by talking a little bit about what you think some of the major prevention strategies can be to mitigate um, burnout in healthcare across the globe. Let's keep in mind here that we're not just yeah. talking about the systems that this group of panelists are familiar with, um, but this global concern. I think it's very important, this last part that you mentioned, uh, that is across the globe, that the system doesn't apply just for us, but it's different for anyone. So I think number one would be a, a, to analyze and, and personalize your, your, your system. The, the system map strategy is something that everyone can do, that you can start looking at all the different perspectives and be there, be in your system, live it, and know every little part that is going on. Um, an, an administrator uh, usually needs to go to the field to see how the janitor is doing, how the physician is doing, how everyone in the field and the task that is a day to day so that they can have a, a, a grasp of what's uh, happening there. And, and second, um, having this in, this in mind and, and what's going on, uh, well, try to begin to change and, and take the risk to go for interventions, evidence-based. The patient safety movement has has a, a lot of interventions that had, a, can a, be re, a, related and can apply to their system and adapt them based on what you build or what you created. And my, mindfulness, uh, being mindful that this is a problem, that this can can be prevented and this can um, can be acted. Um, it's something that we should keep uh, in mind and, and clinicians and also uh, hospital leaders can must have in mind this uh, draw them map point their map and see where 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 are the issues and see where are the the leverage points where are the the feedback loops where are the unintended consequences of doing x y or c uh, i think that's the best prevention strategy one size doesn't fit all they must do it by uh, each uh, one Hmm. Oscar, um, a couple of things that you said in there that I think I would like to put some highlight on, and it came up um, from one of our audience members today, is that there's often a great distance between the individuals who are uh, designing and implementing the procedures, policies, you know, shaping those systems. There's often a great distance between what they're doing and the patient care, the direct care. 
Um, so one of the things that, that occurs to me is what might we be able to do more of to help people have more direct experience um, with that day-to-day -day care? And with that, Kim, I'll turn to you. Let's, let's hear from you about what you think would be the highlights of preventative, but on the day-to-day, -day, um, not on the preventative, so I'm sorry, but on the interventions with regard to the day-to-day -day care and mitigating burnout. Certainly. I think that, you know, it's important to recognize that we often give our patients times where they are not disturbed, right? We, they have times when we will not pass meds, times when we won't do vitals, we allow them sleep holidays, and that's important for their healing, but we don't do that for ourselves. And I think that as administrators, as employees, we have to advocate for those holidays ourselves, even if it's one day. And I, um, as a former director, really enjoy the idea of the no call day. This is the day that even if the place is on fire, your best friend isn't gonna text you to say, oh my gosh, can you believe this happened? Right, just that one day, even a month, when an employee has a chance to just not have to be concerned with work. Because we know with technology, we are all so connected every day to everything that's happening. Uh, a colleague of mine is on maternity leave, but she knows every single day what's happening in this institution because her friends are texting her, right? So just recognizing that that time is necessary away from the bedside, same as it is for patients. Um, I think from a day-to-day -day perspective, uh, just immediately recognizing when bad events occur and intervening, not just recognizing it, but immediately having intervention. We implement SISM, which is a crisis management um, for that critical incident, right? So there's something that happens and then there's an immediate response by a team of specialists. I've seen in the chat multiple people referencing mental health. These are individuals who are trained in that crisis response that deploy to the unit, maybe via telephone, maybe they present physically to the unit, but they engage with everyone that's involved in that situation. If it was a bad code, the bedside nurse potentially that that you know, feels that maybe they didn't do something right. The family member that just lost a loved one, really individualizing that intervention to each individual that was impacted by that negative um, event. And then also really just being collaborative from a day-to-day -day perspective. If we are not collaborative, and that is, I know that everyone said it across the way, but really from the physician to the nurse to the patient, we all have to be engaged in the treatment plan and if we're not all engaged in that treatment plan, then we don't have as much success, right? So if we all agree to a treatment plan, or at least recognize and acknowledge that this is the treatment plan that's set, then there is a lower expectation of going beyond that. So as a, as a healthcare provider, recognizing that a medication, we know our meds are due every certain you know, every four hours or whatever it may be, but have making sure that the patient understands that too, writing it on their whiteboard so that they understand the expectations, really being clear um, and collaborative, having the physician explain, this is why the medication is ordered every four hours, et cetera. Um, I think that that collaboration is really critical. And then also when addressing those behaviors that are really um, high risk, those one, we all have patients that, um, and we sometimes ourselves demonstrate really high risk behaviors and making sure that we are working collaboratively with our team to approach those and to address them. And then finally, um, from a day to day, just really addressing moral injury. Uh, I think that not only our healthcare workers are faced with moral injury, but our patients are directly impacted by it as well. If, an, if the, the staff that is caring for a patient is struggling with a decision that is being made for that patient, by that patient, uh, on behalf of the medical team, and they're struggling from a moral and ethical perspective, it's important that we address that and that we do so in a, a manner that's not objectifying that distress but recognizing it as something that we all experience. Oh, there's so much in there, Kim. And I, um, I want to emphasize that Donna and Olivia and Isabel, who are sort of uh, the foundation of this webinar today, are taking resources like what you've mentioned and, and what other panelists and they have also at their disposal um, and putting a resource list together for the um, audience here today and for those who will be listening later. So. Um, if you didn't catch all of the uh, all of the references that Kim made there, um, just know that we will have a resource list for you. 
a, a number of years ago, long before COVID and the pandemic um, circumstances exacerbated burnout so strongly, I had the great fortune of working with a healthcare system in the Salt Lake City area with a leader who knew to give a lot of time and understanding with um, several nursing teams. We did a, a pilot program or we, we started to scope out a pilot program. And one of the, th one of the key results of our I think it was almost a six month um, discovery process is that just like you just said, Kim, every single patient has their own treatment plan. That is because they are individuals, their needs are unique and you cannot subscribe a general plan to all patients. And yet we do try to, to uh, prescribe rather for individuals within our healthcare systems around bur burnout medicate or burnout um, uh, circumstances. And so I, I think it's really important for us to remember that, and it certainly came up in that discovery process with the healthcare system in Salt Lake City, is that if we give processes to individuals to create what they know resources them so that they have the agency to safely care for themselves and their patients or their systems that they are designing, um, we stand a much better chance of creating environments that are conducive for thriving and are safe in the delivery of care. That individualization cannot be underscored strongly enough, in my opinion. And um, we do trend, we trend toward generalizations on matters that um, certainly there are things that we can learn, like the systems map that Oscar put together that will help us see where to put those levers in place. Um, but that does not replace the individual care treatment for each individual. So thank you for emphasizing that. Colonel Stout, let's hear from you about more of a long-term view, especially since you are now a retired Colonel from the US Army. What's your perspective as you start to look back, but also to look forward into more of a long-term intervention strategy? Uh, I think that's a you know, very complex question. Uh, it depends on you know, the organization for uh, you know, what, what the priority is, uh, but that, that has to be narrowed down. Uh, you know, there's just, you know, increasing priorities and everything seems like it's, it's emergency and it really takes an effort uh, to uh, focus on that and decide what's really going to have the most uh, effect. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, it's very helpful for an organization to take the time to review their uh, staffing model, uh, as we call it, a bottom-up review uh, looking at each individual area by itself uh, and looking at their workload, uh, looking at the measurement of tasks uh, and seeing if the right mix of staffing personnel are on hand. Do we have the right mix of uh, professionals and administrative staff? Um, is, you know, what's the reliance on automation? Is that really helpful? In some areas, you know, we, we add an automated tool thinking that it's, uh, you know, this, this great savior where actually it's just adding a, an additional benefit um, barrier. Uh, you, you know, there's uh, and sometimes an over-reliance on something being electronic or automated uh, where a piece of paper uh, has always worked uh, and will continue to work. Um, you know, we, when that electronic system fails, then, you know, organizations can struggle to uh, complete tasks because they become so reliant on it. One of the things that I think has been uh, successful at organizations, I know there are some organizations that, that do this, uh, is, you know, we, most organizations will do exit interviews with uh, individuals as they uh, choose to leave an organization. Uh, they will, you know, ask them their questions, get their feedback. And some organizations will actually do stay interviews. Uh, and I think that uh, can be very helpful is to take the time to sit with employees that choose to stay uh, and uh, find out the, their specific reasons. Uh, are there certain initiatives? Uh, is there certain drivers uh, that really keep them there, keep them with the organization? And when you find those, uh, and we say we, we exploit them, uh, we offer those opportunities uh, more globally to other individuals. 
I think one thing that would be helpful uh, as a global healthcare community is a formal publication of rights and responsibilities for the healthcare provider. Uh, I know it exists in uh, certain areas. It's been uh, written to um, and in some level, but I, in my opinion, I don't, I've never seen it you know, globally um, promoted or uh, produced uh, that we actually publicize that. There are, you know, the, the patient rights and responsibilities, I think are more uh, highly seen um, and talked about, but I think there's, uh, there's some benefit for the healthcare providers, certainly during these times to be recognized uh, and to set that expectation with our, with our patients, uh, you know, in those healthcare contacts. Uh, they, we seem to have um, also, you know, patient population that's under stress. They're, they're frustrated uh, and they come in and they are, uh, seem to be increasingly hostile or uh, have demands, you know, of what they believe um, is required of the medical community to provide to them um, without really allowing for the healthcare team to identify what the issue is and what the best resource would be for, for that patient. Uh, I think there's really a need to go back to that collaborative um, patient uh, interaction where the healthcare provider can sit with their patient um, and determine their needs and explain to them uh, what they feel uh, is truly uh, will be in their best interest for the optimal patient outcomes. Mm. There's a lot in there. Um, thank you, all three of you, for sort of looking at the you know the prevention strategies, the day to day, and the long term. I, I will add one that I would say I would maybe put it in the near term category, and that is um, pairing up the education system with the with the delivery of care. Um, and also there is a, there has been so much change. And I, I think it was uh, Nancy or Terry who brought this up um, in the chat that a lot of individuals come into their um, clinical or you know their medical delivery of care because they came in to actually deliver care, not deliver administrative um, tasks. And um, I, do, I, I do understand that there is often a mismatch in the way in which individuals are being prepared. And then actually what happens when they get that first job and they start to work with individuals who came in uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago under very different circumstances. Um, it also, it, it strikes me as really interesting occasionally when I hear people talk about the reasons people go into healthcare. And I think we often limit our thinking about people going into healthcare because they are compassionate and want to deliver care. And certainly that is in large part, that is true. But also these are career choices. These are um, uh, living and uh, these are financial choices that individuals make. And so making sure that we align the intentions of the individual and what the reasons that they are going into the fields that they are going in with what they will actually be doing day to day in their work. We have one question from our audience. So I'm going to start to turn toward our audience questions here. And so I will invite everyone to use the Q&A area to add that. And these are questions that we'll pose to uh, Colonel Stout, Oscar, and Kim. The first one comes from Dharmic Nimana, and I apologize if I'm not saying your name correctly. She asks, or they ask, can we create key performance indicators or KPIs for burnout? purposes. How might we do that? Uh, what would the details of that mean? What would the details of that look like? Kim, are you seeing some efforts to put some KPIs with regard to KPI um, in place at your hospital system? Not specifically. However, I can speak from a general perspective. And when we talk to measuring burnout, we are doing a lot of work currently around like the workplace violence and the work, the work around workplace violence and we're developing those indicators to measure that. I believe that those indicators very closely align with burnout because we know that the two are very close, that there's a close relationship between the two, but I can't say that we're using anything specific. I don't know if 
whether the other panelists can speak specifically to that. Thank you. Uh, Oscar, Colonel Stout, either of you have something to contribute for that question? I think there's a, a lot of belief in the organization that they are that they are measuring uh, burnout, uh, that they have uh, effective tools uh, for that, but I'm not sure that we do. Uh, I think you know we find those things that we feel we can objectively measure, um, and you know we're trying to measure a lot of things that are very subjective. Uh, so, you know, there's, uh, I, I saw a reference in the, in the chat, uh, you know, for bean counters, uh, you know, those uh, resource personnel that uh, think that, you know, here we have this tool, here's what we're measuring, this is, this is really a reflection of it, uh, but it's so, it's so diverse, I, I think it can be uh, very difficult to truly measure uh, burnout in, in individuals. Um, and as you know, it's been mentioned before, you know, when it's uh, also affecting you. Uh, so our, you know, administrators are, are under an extreme amount of pressure um, and we often feel uh, strained to uh, be effective, um, you know, without having uh, taken the time to do our, you know, own personal uh, resiliency uh, as well so that we can remain effective for um, our personnel. I, I know I was assigned to the, um, the U.S. Army Burn Center for several years uh, and I was doing burn flight missions uh, for a number of years and, you know, the workload just increased and increased and, you know, I, I found myself doing, you know, back to back missions overseas. Uh, and, you know, I thought, you know, okay, this is my job. This is, this is what I do. Uh, and it actually took, um, you know, somebody to come in and stand there in front of me and uh, in, in good military fashion, order me uh, to leave, to go home. Uh, and and to point out to me <laughs> very uh, distinctly that I was not being as effective as I thought I was. So I thought uh, just being there and continuing to do the tasks was um, the expectation, the requirement, um, and clearly I I could do it. Uh, and I, I was not uh, again being effective like like I thought uh, that I was at the time, and and that needed to be pointed out to me as well. I admire the person who who brought that to your attention in, in a way that you were able to hear it. I uh, wish there was more of that. I think we could use more of that today. Oscar, any comments on that before I move to the next question? Yeah, I would just like to add that uh, maybe measuring um, burnout would be like how bad is too bad or getting into the zone of, okay, this is bad, but not too bad. And and, and starting to, to play with that thin line and, and because sometimes as the leaders think that if I can if I can handle that workload they can or they must because that's a, a erroneous a wrong way of, of of thinking because usually you're not living with them so I think what we need more is empathy with the with the other staff and instead of measuring um, how bad is 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 too bad or 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 they can do this but they is not it's just a uh, start to to be more mindful of, of the situation and and more empathic with all your co-workers and your your the people working below next and over you in many ways all three of you have have identified one of the barriers that is at an individual level and that is that one of the impacts of burnout is our perception might be skewed. We might actually feel like our capacity or that we can um, rally to continue. And we forget that that can have consequences with regard to safety, with regard to our own safety, with regard to um, the other individuals in our, um, in our personal systems that are impacted by our behaviors as well. And so what can we put in place to help um, bring that into awareness in such a way. And I, and I do think that that little lends itself to the, the predeterminations that we make, the agreements, the operational agreements that we make, whether it's within our teams, within our um, organization, within our households, within our networks to say, okay, when this happens, I'm gonna raise the flag and this is what we are predetermining to do as a result of that versus waiting for that moment when we are under stress or in a, a state of burnout to try to make hard, dis difficult decisions. 
I'll call on Susan Hunter's question for you next, and then we'll start to move toward closure here. Um, and maybe I'll just ask you, uh, Kim, do you see efforts in your system that are addressing that conundrum of sending people home when it is necessary and managing that alongside the staffing shortages. I know that UPMC is particularly focusing on this with some of the work that Tammy Minier is um, doing. Would you speak to that just briefly? And then um, I'll start to move us toward close for this webinar. Certainly. So if I understand that, just so I want to be sorry that I understand the question, the, what, the work that we're doing to get our patients safely transitioned to the community, is that uh, no, I'm so sorry. Um, actually, managing sh uh, the shortages, the staffing shortages <laughs> oh, sure. in your hospital system, okay. but also um, making sure that people get sent home when they okay. are, uh, the staff is sent home. Got you. Okay, I'm sorry. And they're not overburdened. Yeah. Managing that sorry. Fine line. I apologize. Yes, one of, um, so I, obviously the nursing shortage, and I can speak to that directly, the nursing shortage has impacted every center of the world. So we do know that um, this is a global impact currently. What our institution has done, and you did mention Tammy, so I will mention specifically what we have done at our institution is developed an internal staffing agency. So we developed a, an agency within UPMC where nurses can commit to traveling anywhere within our system specifically and they are paid a higher rate. They are paid, you know, near that travel rate, and they will commit to any facility. So it really is improving our staffing ratios greatly. We gen we initially anticipated that many of our own individual staffs would shift into this position, but instead, what we found was we brought a lot of those individuals back that initially had left our institution. People that love the institution that left for whatever reason that opportunity to travel that are now having that opportunity still working within the healthcare system. And I think that that is just monumental when we consider some of the, uh, the, um, the efforts that institutions are taking to retain their staff. Um, in regards to sending our individuals home, uh, making sure that our, our leadership, I, I can't speak high enough to the leadership at, at my institution. For everyone from our director of nursing picking up shifts on a Sunday to help ensure that the staff have a day off. Um, to, you know, our medical directors working in the emergency department, seeing patients, triaging patients. It's just the, the work has been so collaborative. And we talked about that, right, that, that importance of collaboration. So between the internal staffing agency and really seeing leadership step into those roles and assist it in every way possible, um, we are, I, I think our, we're going to see an immense um, impact on our retention. Thank you, Kim. I'm sorry to interrupt you. And I wish we had time for all of the questions, but I'm going to turn it back over to Donna conclude, to conclude the webinar today. Thank you, Colonel Stout, Kim, Oscar, and for everyone who attended the broadcast today and who will be listening later. Um, we could probably spend days on this topic, and I, I hope that this will just be the beginning of the conversation through the foundation today. Donna? Thank you, Vanga, and thank you to all of the panelists. What a fabulous discussion today. Um, Vanga is absolutely right. I think we could we can talk about this, um, you know, uh, uh, for days. So um, thank you all to the to the attendees today and for your in, you know interactive chats and questions. We will be answering any questions that we didn't get to afterwards, and we'll post those on our YouTube page. Um, and of course, I just want to reinforce that if you want continuing education for this, then you will receive a, an email from MedStar if you are a nurse, physician, pharmacist, or respiratory therapist who indicated that you wanted that credit. Um, for healthcare executives or certified professionals in patient safety, um, or for, for healthcare executives, log into your ACHE account. For certified professionals in patient safety or board certified patient advocates, you'll get a certificate from us. And NAHQ will log your, your attendance if you are looking for CPHQ credit. Here at the Patient Safety Movement, we, we try to provide all of this learning for free. So we would love for your support in this. If there's any amount that you can donate, please do visit our website, donate a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, and it'll, it'll help us to continue to offer this uh, fabulous content
free of charge. Please do visit our YouTube page afterwards. We'll let everybody know when that's up there. Uh, we post all of our videos, all of our webinars on our YouTube page afterwards. And in the description, you'll see all of the resources that we have talked about today. So thank you again to everybody for, for joining us today. Fonda, as always, best moderator. We, we love when you come and, 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 uh, and lead our discussion. So, um, and thank you to Kimberly, Oscar, and Luis. It was just lovely to have you today. So everybody thank have you. a wonderful day.